Hey everyone, this is episode 3 of I'm a Ranger at Wolf Lake National Park. If you missed the first two episodes, uh, they'll be linked in the top of the description below. Thanks. It's strange where I am. 1998, I guess. Summer, I think. Dang, it's hot. I bring my hand up to my face to wipe the sweat from my eyes, and that's when I notice that my hands are different. They are not my hands. They are so much younger and fresher than my hands. There is no rough skin or scars that I knew I had. I look around a full 360 degrees. I am in a park, a children's playground to be exact. I was staring at a large climbing frame. There were four other young boys who were playing on the climbing frame. Two were at the bottom, going about their own thing. The other two sat on the top, like kings of the castle, talking to each other. Slightly to the right, there was a swing set. The two seats were hanging still, unused. To the left, a slide. A young girl around ten was helping her little sister climb up the steps and holding her hand as she sloped down the ramp, a smile plastered on her innocent face. To my extreme right, a trio of benches were situated around the playground's exterior. On it sat three sets of parents. They were all laughing and joking, all mucking in and talking to one another. Three close-knit families, enjoying a lovely sunny afternoon playdate at the park. There was one kid, however, that I hadn't clocked. The parents rose from the benches, calling their children. The two boys at the top of the climbing frame rolled their eyes and climbed down. They gave each other a high five and split up, running to their respective families. And the little girl who was on the slide began crying and screaming as her sister and parents were telling her that it was time to go home. They dispersed, clearing the view of the kid who was all by himself. He was on the merry-go-round, slowly spinning himself around in a depressive manner. He was perched on the edge, his arms dangling as he grabbed the bars flanking him. He stared at the dirt zipping past on the ground, watching his toes dragging the hot, dusty ground. I noticed him, and so did the man who was with me. See that little boy over there? A deep, raspy voice whispered into my right ear. The smell of rotten meat and body odor going so far up my nose, I could taste it in my mouth. Two hands that grabbed my shoulders. The fingers were abnormally long. The fingernails overgrown and brittle, with pieces of meat and dirt lodged under them. Yes, I answered timidly. My voice was uncontrollably weak and trembling. My body felt savaged and I felt like I was going to constantly vomit. I want him, boy. You want this to be all over, don't you? Well, for that to happen, I first need something else to play with. So, if you want me to stop, then you will get him for me. The voice said with that same deliberate, raspy whisper. His words dragged out as he seemed to drool over his newfound prey. I looked at my hands again. This time, I wasn't looking at youthful, untouched skin. I was looking at the arms of a ravaged object. I wasn't a boy, not anymore. I looked at my wrists. They were black and blue. Shallow cuts where I had struggled against the duct tape. Small, circular burns where I had been used as an ashtray. The man had dressed me in a long sleeve t-shirt. I dare not pull my sleeves or my shirt, cringing at what scars and marks I would likely find. Go on. If you want me to put you out of your misery, then you need someone to take your place. The voice whispered in command. I looked at the child. He had an empty look on his face, idly letting the world go by, contemplating his problems, whatever they were. They were about to get worse. Oh, so worse. I am so sorry. I didn't want to go over. Truly, I didn't. 
but I was in so much pain. The idea of my death was a total relief. I didn't know why. I just knew I wanted whatever it was to stop. As I walked over to the merry-go-round, I felt what human I had left in me, wanting to scream and tell the boy to run. I didn't know. I approached him, smiling like a true liar. I made myself sick. I sat down beside him. He was a loner, desperate to make an easy friend. He told me that his dad told him to play while he went to get him an ice cream cone. He used air quotes and then proceeded to tell me that it meant he was probably picking up a couple of six packs and a bottle of bourbon. I couldn't help but pity him. It showed on my face. Hey, at least I made a new friend. I don't meet too many new people. I don't really have any friends. The boy confessed with a squeaky tone to his innocent voice. I smiled, gently inhaling through my nose. The smell of putrid, rotten meat filled my nostrils once more. I shuddered. I'm great, because I have another friend who would like to meet you. I sat up straight as the crack of thunder ran through the cabin. Once again, I tried to control my breathing. As I took deeper breaths, I swear that I could still smell the hint of dirty meat in the back of my nostrils. I shook it off though. I checked the clock. 5.55am. I may as well get up now, I thought to myself. I stumbled over to the kitchen counter in a sleepy daze, flicking the kettle on and taking off one of the cups that Phil had rinsed off yesterday off the drying rack. Another nightmare. What the hell? I said to no one in particular. I had had nightmares before, who hasn't, right? But I had never had them so lucid before. I read about Danny Waldron, and then I dream about Danny Waldron. I read about some horrible child taker from 20 years ago, and then lo and behold, I have some dream about some horrible presence and an abused child. Did it mean something? Or was it just the vulnerability brought on by my new surroundings, causing my mind to go into overdrive when reading these horror stories from the local area? I wasn't sure what to make of it all. I finished making my cup of coffee and made up a flask too, knowing that a long day was ahead. An hour later, I was locking the cabin door up behind me, backpack with food, water, and other essential supplies strapped to my upper back. I turned and surveyed the damage that last night's rain had inflicted to the dirt to clearing that sat between my cabin and the tree line. Just as I was groaning at the thought of a 10 mile hike in the mud, I heard a buzzing noise beginning to slowly drown out my exaggerated sigh. Mud flew and splattered the nearby trees as Phil and his ATV came tearing down towards my cabin. He made quite a stylish skid stop pulling up to the bottom step of my cabin's porch. He lifted up his goggles and gave me that signature fatherly wink. I thought you might appreciate a lift. Phil shot it up to me. I couldn't help but smile. More than you would think, I said as I skipped down the steps, jumping on the back of the quad bike. Hold on tight, kid. I have to be up at the crime scene for 7.30 sharp. I'm helping Alan organize these search parties. I took a detour, though. There was no way I was leaving you to walk two days running. Phil said, as the ATV whizzed up the trail towards the more northeastern section of the park. Me and Phil couldn't speak to one another while he was pelting full speed through the mid-morning air. I had around 25 minutes of self-reflection, and I began to think about the news report. There had been enough time passed where I could still remember the dream that I'd had, but it wasn't so lucid that it was all I remember. I thought back to what had caused the dream, and then I remembered the reporter talking about a man, the burger man, Edward Keller. The news story talked about some sadistic murderer operating in Wolf Lake during the late 90s, a Keller who incidentally killed himself in these very woods exactly one year to the day 
before Danny Waldron went missing. Phil told me that story about the dogs not finding anything, and his death being a suspected drowning was a complete cover story. He said that they had found an item of Danny's clothing buried where the dogs had lost the trail. A pair of underwear. Hazard Control had covered it up and never told the parents of that finding, so there's no way to definitively identify if they belonged to Danny. But the dogs had followed his scent from his other clothing to that spot, and no other belongings were missing from his bag. All of that, coupled with the fact that I had found a newspaper article, which contained a press release documenting, stating that Edward Keller had kept a pair of underwear worn by each of his child victims as a souvenir. I started to creep myself out by thinking about the parallels between the two cases. I tried to stop thinking about it, but the more that I tried, the more my mind went digging. I started to think about what else Phil had told me, and then I remembered what he had told me about Wendy Cartwright and the figure she saw running away with the child. She told the rangers that the figure instructed her to shush and placed a finger over its mouth. Edward Keller was reported to have done that to his final victim, Alex Jessup, signaling to the young boy that if he made a sound, he would slaughter his parents in their beds, much like he had done to the other victim's parents. Maybe there was a copycat killer replicating the crimes of Edward Keller. I knew of two cases at this national park, Danny Waldron's disappearance and the Robertson family murders, the children, whom of which are still missing. Both of them fit the profile of the Keller murders. Danny Waldron was able to have been taken without alerting his family, thus the adults surviving. Whereas the Robertson children, Riley and Ashley, were clearly taken by Forrest. Perhaps whoever took the children gave them the same ultimatum, threatening them that if they made a fuss or called out for help, that then they would take out the adults as well. Maybe that's what happened. Danny Waldron went quietly and then, Riley and Ashley didn't. Edward Keller murdered 20 adults and 19 children, meaning he roughly killed one in two of each of his victim's parents, meaning that likely the kids he was able to snatch with no interruptions were the ones who weren't made orphans. I needed more information. I needed to find out how many other crimes like Danny Waldron and the Robertsons had occurred in this park since Edward Keller's death. I also needed to dig up every Edward Keller victim and try to find some more similarities between his crimes and the disappearances at Wolf Lake. I was so immersed in thoughts and conspiracy theories that I hadn't felt the ATV pull up. Everything okay, James? You look lost, son. Phil had a concerned look on his face, and he was right, though. I barely even heard him. Um, yeah, I, uh, just... I fumbled my words. Trailing officer tried to weigh up whether or not I should ask Phil about Keller. After all, I only had this job because the lad before me asked too many questions himself. Jesus, a long night again. He asked as he put his goggles into the compartment under the seat. He had another nightmare. What was it about this time? He added as we walked up toward the search team and forensic white tents. I don't really know. I was in a park, someone was with me, and they stunk of gone-off meat. They were telling me to bring them a child, who was sad in this merry-go-round. I went over and uh, I started to talk to him. I was all beaten and scratched up. I just, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember anything after I think that was when I woke up. I was concentrating so hard trying to remember that I didn't look at Phil. When I did, I saw he was looking highly concerned. I emphasized his smile, trying to ease his anxiety. It seemed that it wasn't working, however, so I just came out with it. Everything alright, Phil. Now you look lost, I said with a slight chuckle. Don't say a flaming word to anyone about your nightmares, he commanded, as we got around three feet from the group. I started to slowly nod, more in confusion than agreement. Do you hear me, James? He demanded to know, 
with a hushed scream as we were about to join the group. Yeah, I said, now concerned myself. Phil nodded, keeping a stern look in his face. And then, in a blink of an eye, as we had joined the group, he transformed straight back into the happy-go-lucky, salt-of-the-earth individual that I had come to know. He shook hands with a number of strangers that I did not know yet. There was only one person of notes, apparently, as this was who Phil had introduced me to. He put his hand on the shoulder of a short yet stocky man. The man definitely wouldn't be a first-round draft pick for an NBA side, but you certainly wouldn't be in a hurry to get in the octagon with him. He had salt and pepper dark hair and a beard that would make a lumberjack jealous. Phil ushered him over and introduced the man with enthusiasm. This is the new kid, James. He's come all the way from Atlanta. HQ got him set up at the new build cabin down in Zone 2. He's a good one, Mark. James, this is Head Ranger Mark. Mark Atwood, my boss. Phil said with a grin, and Mark grabbed my hand and clamped on it, firmly shaking it. Mark Atwood was definitely raised by a father who believed a handshake was everything. I imagined it was that handshake that got him this job and subsequent promotions here at Wolf Lake. Nice to meet you, Mark. I've heard loads about you. I said concentrating more on being manly with my handshake. Mark chuckled. All bad, I hope. He said with a wink. I could see why Phil and Mark got on. Over the course of the next few minutes, Phil and Mark split everyone in a park ranger uniform and a search and rescue vest into two teams. I couldn't help but be taken back to high school gym class and the two popular kids at picking the soccer teams. Except this time, I was picked first. Phil wasn't kidding. He was keeping me close. Phil showed our group a map of the surrounding area. There was a red pin on the map where we stood at the campsite. There was a circle drawn around the pin. That to scale was a 15 mile radius from the campsite. A black cross was drawn inside the circle and each quartet was numbered 1 to 4. Right guys, listen up. Yesterday we found four bodies in zone 3 during the searches of zones 3 and 4. They were identified as Amanda, Barbara, Dave, and Mitchell Robertson. Today, we're searching Zone 2. Mark's team will search Zone 1. Again, we're looking for any signs of Riley and Ashley Robertson, living or deceased, or simply anything that leads us closer to their whereabouts. As Phil barked out the orders, handing out an enlarged map of Zone 2 to every personnel, I stood 50% listening to Phil, 50% listening to the questions flying around in my head. Phil's reaction to my confession of having a series of nightmares began to make me think there was something significant to it. Phil started to put everyone into pairs, marking on their respective maps and where he wanted them to search. Hey, it's me and you, kid. Time to learn the job, Phil shouted, finally after everyone else had their teams. I produced a singular nod and forced a smile through my clouded thoughts. Phil came up to me, handing me the map. You and me, James, we'll be searching this section of the zone, he said, as his fingertip landed on the top left corner of the zone. Here, it's around a five square mile area. It'll give us plenty of time to talk, huh? He said, making sure only I heard we made our way down to the ATV, hopped on and Phil rode us out as close to the search area as we could get. The area that we rode out to honestly took my breath away. The mid-morning sunrise was peeking over the huge hillside on the opposite side of the river and beginning to wash over into the dense understory of which we stood. A family of rabbits skipped from under a log and hopped into the nearby marshland. A squirrel ran up a tree in a spiral fashion like he was in the lighthouse. A flock of birds burst from a nearby tree, the large collection of feathers exploding and dispersing into the baby blue sky. From the sky to the ground, the wildlife produced an audible crescendo of vocals that would put the London Symphony Orchestra to shame. And for a very brief moment, I took all of this in, completely forgetting about what had happened to the Robertson family. 
At times like this, it is truly alien to think that something so dark can happen in a place as amazing and beautiful as this. Philip instructed the teams that if they found anything of significance, that they were to radio him immediately. I imagined that was to keep whatever was found under wraps. We divided our search zone up into squares. We would search each square thoroughly, before ticking it off on the map and moving on to the next one. The other teams would also be operating the same way. We started off, walking in a bit of an awkward silence, scanning the floor for anything, no matter how small or insignificant. Blood droplets, drag marks, footprints, items of clothing, etc. Sorry. Phil broke the silence first. Sorry for biting your head off earlier about the nightmare. It's just that. He sighed. He began to explain before losing his words. Just what, Phil? I asked, eager for answers, as he was starting to worry me. I had tried to tell myself that my dreams were just the results of an overactive imagination. However, I was finding it harder and harder to do that. It's just that Billy... Billy also had dreams, Phil confided. And I don't mean he had high ambitions, either. He quipped. Billy, the kid who's missing. That Billy, oh great. I said sarcastically. What did he dream about? Phil looked away into the woods, kissed his teeth and bit his lip, weighing up his response. He said he started having really lucid dreams. It started off small, you know, getting lost in the woods and stuff like that. And then one day, I come to pick him up for work and he looks lost. Not too different from the look you gave me this morning. I asked him about it and he told me that he had a dream. He said he was camping with his parents. He said the dream took place at night. He started to talk about a man, hung from his neck in a tree. He wasn't dead though. In fact, he was smiling, whispering to Billy, telling him to come into the woods. Phil must have seen my pores open and sweat begin to burst from my forehead. I felt the color from my face hit the tips of my toes. I had a knot on my stomach that I thought would never come undone. He had that concerned, anxious look on his face once again. You're scaring me, James. Have you had the same nightmare? We were no longer searching. We were stood facing each other. I was a lifeless form with Phil having a handful of both my shoulders. He was firmly shaking me trying to bring me back to the land of the living. I could just about muster two words. Edward Keller. As if saying the words themselves were an antidote to a poison coursing through my veins, I started to come round from my day state. My eyes stopped rolling around on my head and now stared dead into Phil's soul. Edward Keller. I said this time with much more intent. What about him? Phil asked, his voice rattled. He's been dead for over 15 years. I know, but I think that's who Billy saw in his dream. He died in this park, didn't he? Yeah, he hung him. Oh, Phil stopped himself mid-sentence as he came to the realization. Exactly, Phil. I think I've been dreaming about him too. Or at least some twisted manifestation of him, I said pleading to Phil with my eyes, begging him not to cart me off to the loony bin. Look, James, these woods, they can make even the strongest of souls feel vulnerable, especially when it's their first time. You need to stop watching the crime channel on a night. You're not doing yourself any favors. We see enough horror out here as it is. Edward Keller was a real piece of work. And yes, he did die in these woods, but... Phil was cut off by me grabbing him by his shoulders and looking him dead in the eye, letting him know how deadly serious I was. But what if he didn't? I glared into Phil's eyes, trying to gauge his reaction. There was a part of me that had a hint maybe Phil knew more about the events of this park than he let on. 
His reaction earlier this morning told me as much. What if Phil Edward Keller never actually committed his own death? I was totally aware that I looked crazy. My eyebrows were touching my hairline, and my eyes were wild. Phil still didn't say anything, and I continued my rant. I didn't seem to be able to stop. You've said that hazard control suppresses the truth, especially if it affects the financial interests of the town. Think about it. Edward Keller is a serial killer, one that targets families and their children. As far as family holidays were going, no one was touching this place with a 10-foot pole. And now think about it. You also told me that the police pretty much answered to hazard control. They ruled Danny as a drowning, remember? Despite concrete evidence, he wasn't anywhere near the water. So what if the police in HQ told the world that Edward Keller had died? Not only would people think that he was gone, resulting in tourism returning, but I heard that hundreds of paranormal groups come here every year because of this place's history. Not only does tourism resume, but it increases. I started to smile and nodding at Phil. What I was saying really was starting to make sense. And to me anyway. So, don't you see? This isn't some copycat serial killer. It's Edward Keller himself. He uses the same MO. Takes kids, kills adults if necessary. Collects underwear as trophies and the reason we never find the kids. It's because he eats them. That's how he survived all these years out here. Just like he did from 97 to 2003. Phil looked at me. He looked almost panicked. Not quite the reaction that I was hoping for. I wanted Phil to tell me that I was right and tell me that. We were going to hunt this guy down with the help of the National Park Service and the FBI. And prosecute everyone who's aided and embedded this monster among men. And get some justice for everyone who suffered because of him. For God's sake, you can't be saying this stuff, James. I need you to put a lid on it. Do your job and let's search for these kids. Phil commanded, pointing to my face. I felt a degree of frustration and anger. Search for these kids. You know damn well we won't find them. You said as much yesterday at your tower. I snapped back. I know, but I shouldn't have said that. Phil said in an ashamed tone, looking away to avoid the awkwardness. But you did. I snapped again. You tell me about all this horrible stuff. Put all this crap in my head and now you're cold shouldering me. What is really going on, Phil? Because now I know what's going on. Phil exploded, his breathing rapid. If there had been a gust of wind at that very moment, I would have been flat on my back. Before I could even respond, Phil's radio sparked to life. Phil, it's Alan. I'm with Higgins. You better get yourself over to Zone 1. We found something. Mine and Phil's gazes locked once again. The atmosphere was intense. Phil slid his radio back into its holster and flicked his head in the direction of the ATV. Come on, let's go, Phil said sheepishly. In awkward silence, we made the 12-minute walk back to the ATV. He jumped out and just before Phil turned the keys, he turned to me. My tower tonight. I'll tell you everything. Phil and I traveled southwest, heading to the coordinates that one of the other rangers had supplied. When we had arrived, a small crowd was forming around a spot on the ground. Two park rangers and two search and rescue officials were examining the dirt, while one of them held an excited German shepherd under restraint. The dog was clearly very interested in whatever it was that was in the earth. Phil and I walked over to the group. The two search and rescue operatives continued to focus on the dirt, while the two rangers turned to greet us. They had quite somber expressions on their face, but upon seeing me, bearing the same uniform as them, they forced a smile and nod each. Hey there, James, right? One of them asked. Tall guy, shaved head, a thick black stubble. Wasn't a bodybuilder or anything, but he seemed to have a lot of upper body strength. My smiled back and confirmed I was in fact James. 
The other one didn't seem to be in much of a talking mood. He remained contentedly the other do the talking. This ranger was a lot shorter, but a very athletic looking man, who clearly had a military background judging simply by the way that he stood. Mousy brown hair, a strong jaw and youthful features, made up his facial appearance. He let his arm around my shoulders, ushering me to the group. He held out his hand in the direction of the first man and proclaimed, James, this is Alan, and then named his hand to the other ranger and declared, And this is Higgins, rangers just like us. We all answer to Mark. So, go on then, boys. What do we have? They both shook my hand, giving me the usual pleasantries when you meet your new co-workers, but they were all business today. We began to walk over to join the others. Alan started to relay the events of the last hour. We headed to our section, began the search at around 8.23 a.m., made our way through the area, and that's when we found it. Higgins joined Alan and paced in a vacant expression on his face. Found what? I asked, desperate to know. Phil gave me a stern look, reminded to keep my conspiracy theories buried for now. Alan continued. We found drag marks, subtle but clear. Two sets of marks, meaning two different pairs of hands, looked to be made by fingertips. Tracks fade as we get into the greener parts of the woods. He started to point at some small plants that had been ripped or pulled. If you look though, the person or persons had made a distinct effort to grab onto nearby shrubs. Phil had a haunted look on his face, clearly having a new level of understanding of what had happened here. I studied his face as Alan continued. The trail ended here, and so we called the dog in. We took Diesel to the start of the trail and let him lead us, to see if there was any scent of the children. And there was. He led us to this spot here. Now we're just waiting for Mark, who is coming with a forensic expert. I think despite Phil clearly knowing more than anyone at this point, we all each had our suspicions about what was in the ground, and we had all each hoped that we were wrong. Speak of the devil and he shall appear. As if on cue, we could hear another ATV's engine humming as it got closer to the scene. It stopped about 50 yards away. Mark and the forensics expert hopped off and jogged over. Mark was all business. He power walked up to the patch of earth that had everyone on the edge of their seats. Right then, what are we looking at? Mark asked, anyone who was willing to answer. Alan filled him in, telling him exactly what he had told me and Phil. You could see Mark start to ponder what sickening thing we might find. He turned to face the expert, who was on hand with a digging apparatus and an evidence bag, and instructed him to put everyone out of their misery. We all stood over the forensic expert as he dug at the dirt, carefully trying not to damage any potential evidence. We all watched on as the digging came to an immediate stop, as the forensic official reached a gloved hand into the hole. As he pulled out two pairs of children's underwear, one boy and one girl, Mark began to hurl profanities and anger at no one in particular. God dang it! What is happening? Who on earth is doing this? These are the 11th and 12th victims and we still don't have a flaming clue what is happening. Why won't HC investigate it? Why do we have to keep blind to the campers, our community, our families? All the while, innocent people are dying and children are being dragged off into the dang forest. I can't take much more of this. I really can't. Alan and Higgins went to console Mark. I continued to watch Phil. He had a look of deepening guilt on his face as he looked on at his good friend Mark, breaking down from the weight of the burden that all this was putting upon him. I could tell that he wanted to tell the rest of them what was happening right there and then, but he didn't. Instead, he looked at me. His eyes glazed over with the first remnants of a tear. I shrugged my shoulders at him, trying to get him to say something to them. But he aimed his gaze away from mine and looked at the floor. He pushed past and made his way to the ATV. Come on, we need to get back and deal with the press. 
and we headed back to the campsite where the Denver 7 News Channel was coming to get a scoop on the latest from the crime scene. Mark and the rest of the group carried on searching for any other sign of the missing children. No doubt in vain. When the ATV pulled up at the campsite, I noticed that Richard was already there. This was the first time that I had seen him in the flesh. He was liaising with Bob Farrar, the Wolf Lake Sheriff. I looked at both with sheer contempt. I had no doubt on my mind that it was these two men who had orchestrated the Edward Killer death cover-up and now that it was coming back to bite them in the butt. They were desperately trying to cover their tracks. More cover-ups instead of simply coming clean and catching this sicko once and for all. Phil and I walked over to Richard and Bob, planning to order to update them on this morning's findings. We were about 100 yards away, and we smiled and waved. This was to keep up appearances while, through a fake smile, I began to lay into Phil in a mocking, sarcastic tone. So what are we doing here, Phil? Telling them that we found underwear again. So what? Just saw these two snakes can tell the press some crap about we found footprints that led right off the edge of a hillside. Just leave it out, James. Please, not here. I can just imagine Richard tonight on the news, can't you? Oh, it's quite simple. We believe Riley and Ashley were escaping happily through the forest when they just walked right off the edge of a cliff. James, stop, please. Absolutely nothing to worry about here at Wolf Lake. Stop. It's not like Edward freaking Keller is on the loose. Phil stopped the happy charade, turned and grabbed me by my throat, his eyes wild, neck veins bulging, knuckles white. Don't say his name. Do you hear me? I was taken aback. I didn't recognize Phil right now. I put my hands up, trying to calm him down. Phil, just take a breath. Come on. Don't talk about it. Don't say his name. Just stop thinking about it. Stop. Phil had lost it. I had not known him long, but I still could never imagine Phil having this side to him. Phil and I had been so focused on our heated moment that we hadn't noticed that we had caught the attention of Richard and Sheriff. He stormed over. Everything okay over here? Richard spoke in a stern, malevolent voice, much like a strict headmaster. It was more of a telling off for showing him up than it was a check on our well-being. Phil pulled himself together and faced Richard. Yeah, it's fine, Richard. I was just... Just what? Richard snapped. Phil didn't have an answer. He just stared at his shoes. A word, please. Now. He snapped again when Phil came up empty. Phil and Richard walked off and stepped inside a portable office trailer. My heart was still racing from Phil's outburst. What had set him off like that? Why was he so desperate for me to stop talking about Edward Keller? What had Phil found out that caused this change in his attitude? All these questions were overtaking my thoughts when Phil and Richard emerged from the porter cabin. They both came out looking in agreement over something, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it when all of a sudden, they both looked at me in unison. The most intense look in their eyes. It made my heart burn and my knees buckle. Something was wrong. Phil walked over to me while Richard headed over to the cops and press. He came up to me, a sorry look on his face. He approached me and ran his hand through his thinning hair, trying to style out his awkward apology. Look kid, I'm really sorry about what happened back there. Richard just gave me a verbal warning. Listen, I filled him in on the finding so there's nothing else for us to do here. Richard has told me to head to the visitor center. Something about some couple who needed camping information. So, you're all done for the day. So, I'll ride to the VC, and you can take the ATV back to your cabin. Just bring it back to the tower tonight at 8pm. I'll get a lift from one of the other workers. It saves you making the hike in the dark. Come on, jump on. Phil hopped on and signaled for me to join him. I was wary though. The last rookie to talk too much about the sinister things happening here at Wolf Lake, who had caught the attention of Richard, went missing and hasn't been seen since. 
What did they talk about in that porter cabin? What was with the look of conspiracy between them when they came out? And now, here Phil is, inviting me to his cabin in the dead of night. Had Richard told him that I am a liability? Has he told Phil that I needed to be dealt with? All of these thoughts raced through my head as we headed to the visitor center. We pulled up outside the VC and Phil jumped off. He gave me a quick tutorial of the quad bike, reminded me not to damage it and to go carefully. I promised that I would. He looked at me intently, placing his hand on my shoulder. It seemed his fatherly manner was back, for now at least. 8 p.m. tonight. I'll explain everything. Not a minute sooner, though. Until then, no reading, no research, and no conspiracy theories. You don't speak to anyone and tell no one where you're going tonight. You promise me. I promise, Phil. I said, giving him a smile. I turned the keys and the bike fired your life and I tore off towards my cabin. As I span the bike around, I couldn't help but notice the U.S. Postal Service box just at the entrance to the park. A light bulb popped up above my head. I needed to do something, because it was obvious what was going to happen. Phil was going to kill me. I spent the five hours between getting back to my cabin and 8 p.m., studying everything I could about the number of disappearances here at Wolf Lake. As far as the actual facts go, I was aware of two cases that were similar to the crimes of Edward Keller, Danny Waldron's disappearance and the Robertson family murders. I needed to know more, though. I needed to put it all in a letter and get it to the press, just in case anything was to happen to me tonight. People needed to know Edward Keller wasn't dead. People needed to have Bob Farrar and Richard Hopkins thrown in prison and finally execute a manhunt for this sadistic murderer, not resting until he was behind bars. I began to lay out each newspaper article that detailed the Edward Keller murders right up until his supposed death and cut out everything of relevance. There wasn't everything there, but it was enough to go on. And I then began to go through the news articles again, looking for stories on deaths and disappearances at Wolf Lake. This was a little more difficult given the lengths hazard control had gone to sweep grisly details of each incident under the rug. But there was one very interesting trait that helped me pick out relevant articles. I put everything that I had found into a frantically written letter, which I addressed to the Denver 7 newsroom. I grabbed the keys to the ATV and made my way out the door. I made sure no one was around when I posted the letter, which contained everything the press needed to connect the dots and expose the Keller death cover-up. Whatever was going to happen to me, I was going to expose these corrupt assholes. At one point, I considered just tearing off into the sunset right there and then. However, I've spent my entire life running from my problems. It's how I ended up here after all. Besides, I had nothing to run to. As I jumped back on the bike and checked my watch, I couldn't help shake the feeling of being watched. I looked around, trying to find the source of my anxiety. I squinted, scanning the surrounding woodland, trying to spot a bush rustling or listening for a snap of a twig, but to no avail. The time was 7.22pm. If I left now, I could reach the tower early and scout out the area. I tore off into the woods and made my way to Phil's tower. I pulled up, 100 yards from the tower at around 7.48 p.m. I jumped off and began to make my way slowly towards the steps that led up to the tower door. As I was walking, I made notes of potential getaway routes, should something go south in there, and then something hit me. A smell. A bad smell. It was horrendous. Stopping me dead on my tracks, I became extremely lightheaded. At first, it smelled to me like thick smoke, but there was a hint of something else. Meat. Burning meat. But the smell was off, like the meat was rotten. It made my stomach turn. I began to power walk towards the tower, desperately trying to get into a more open space so I could breathe in some fresh air. I stumbled up the first few steps to the tower before I stumbled and fell. 
My legs had become exhausted and felt like I had walked for 1,000 miles uphill. Every inch of me was wanting to lie down and rest right there on that stab. My blood began to feel heavy and every cell in my body started to scream for me to close them. I closed them and I began to drift. The smell of burning flesh was becoming worse. I let it take over me. A voice pierced my haze. James, James, can you hear me? It stirred me round. I began to move my body away from the light. Something was pulling my body, pulling it up the steps. The higher we got, the clearer my hearing became and the more energy I seemed to regain. James, stay awake, son. Come on, eyes open. Get inside as quickly as you can. I recognized the voice as Phil's. By the time I was fully in my own self again, I was inside at Phil's watchtower. I was sat on the couch at the same seat as I had sat the previous day. Phil sat across from me in his armchair, Irish coffee in hand. I had a mug full of black in front of me. Get that down, your son. It'll perk you up, Phil advised, a sincere tone to his voice. I was still weary, though. For all I know, he had attempted to poison me. Maybe he got the dose wrong, and that's why I had come round in the end. Maybe this coffee was his second attempt. I turned my nose up and pushed it away. It's okay, Phil. I feel all right now. I said, coming over like a bit of a spoiled brat. Phil didn't seem to mind. He just wanted me to stay awake. I decided that I was alert enough to start getting some answers. So, what is going on, Phil? Why did you lose it today? I cut to the chase. Phil looked washed out, like he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. He looked to be battling with himself in his head and he seemed to avoid the answer, shifting his eyes from the clock to the door. Somewhere you need to be, Phil, I snapped. Phil looked at me, shaking his head sincerely. No, son, it's just... I interrupted him. Just what, Phil? It's just that Edward Keller had just butchered another family and took their children to do God only knows what. Phil burst up from his seat, almost hitting the roof. I told you not to say his name. You're not listening, are you? You're going to end up like them both. I burst up from the couch myself. Like who, Phil? Billy? What's going to happen? As Rich told you to kill me. Well, go on then and get on with it. Because it's all going to come out. I've sent a letter to the press. I was so caught up in the intense standoff with Phil that I didn't notice the tower door open. Would that be this letter, Mr. Parker? Said Richard, as he held the envelope that I had posted earlier in his hand. He was with the police sheriff, Bob Farrar, who was looking out of the window, checking if there was anyone or any witnesses in the vicinity. I looked on in somewhat of a stunned silence as Richard swanned over to the sink. He took out a lighter and ignited the corner of the envelope. He threw it into the sink and the flames began to spread, destroying the contents. He turned to me, giving a fake smile. He pointed to the couch with his eyes, signaling for me to take a seat. I took a look at the sheriff standing between me and the door. I noticed that his weapon holster was unbuttoned. I was unarmed and surrounded. I took my seat. So let me guess. Phil told you that I figured out what you all did. And now you're here to shut me up. I quipped. I don't blame you though. Imagine what people would say or even do if they found out that you lied about a killer being dead just to protect your revenues. Richard carefully removed his jacket and began to fold it in a manner that screamed OCD. As he did... He spoke in a calm and collected manner. Is that what you think? You think you've got it all figured out, don't you? Yeah, I do. I reached down and I rifled into my rucksack, pulling out all the newspaper clippings that I had cut out earlier today. You can't deny it. Look, all these disappearances at the park, all painted as tragic incidents. But look at the dates. All of them match the Edward Keller victims. Richard didn't seem phased at all by what I was saying. He just continued his exaggerated seating ritual of brushing dirt off his trousers and adjusting his shirt cuffs, getting himself comfy in the armchair. 
I continued with my tangent. All these disappearances started after Edward Keller supposedly had died. I read about it in the news. The tourists were swerving Wolf Lake because of all the high-profile murders. When he went on the run, you took that chance to paint him as dead. Both of you, you covered it up and you've been covering it up ever since. Wendy Cartwright saw him that day, didn't she? She described a black figure that told her to shush. The same M.O. as Edward Keller. And every time that we're out looking for a missing child, are you going to sit there and tell me that the underwear we find in the ground isn't Edward Keller collecting more trophies, just like he had kept under his factory floor? Richard nodded softly and turned to face Phil. Philip, would you mind pouring us all the drink of that lovely Irish whiskey? The one that you keep under the sink. Phil looked at Rich, like a kid who had just been caught shoplifting sweets. Richard scoffed. I know everything. You should know that by now, Philip. What time are we on, Bob? May 23 p.m., Rich, Bob said, after a quick check of his watch. All right, that gives us around two hours, so let's get to it, Richard said, as if he was at some sort of board meeting. Bob took his seat and Phil took up the spare seat, dealing out four glasses of whiskey in the process. Richard stretched his neck and took a mouthful of his beverage. He exhaled loudly in delight after savoring a moment of peace. You're right, James. Me and Bob have been covering this up for nearly 17 years now. Richard looked in my eyes, almost a pleading look pasted on his face. Sheriff Farrar had the same. A defeated, heavy look to the demeanors. I knew it, I said, shaking my head in disgust. You don't know Jack, son, the sheriff snapped, taking a huge gulp of his whiskey. Richard gave Bob a look, politely requesting for him to calm down. Please forgive my outburst. You'll soon understand what we've had to deal with for the past 20 years. Richard was continuing to be very sincere. The cold, hard, intimidating exterior was no longer there. He was opening up. Phil was sat, allowing Richard to go on. I had the impression that he got the same speech last night. Edward Keller is dead as a doornail. I promise you. I mean Jesus, we found him. So it's a copycat then? I asked, as that was the most rational alternative. Richard and the sheriff shared a log. No, James, it's not a copycat. I would very much recommend you knack that entire glass of whiskey. I complied. While the whiskey was washing down my neck, burning my throat and beginning to suppress my central nervous system, I heard Richard finish his sentence. And be prepared to keep a very open mind.